Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our facilitators. Chief Executive Officer, DREV, Design Revolution, Krista Donaldson. And Chief Executive Officer, Catapult Design, Heather Fleming. Thanks, you don't have to clap. Okay, so we're doing something very exciting and something very different for the Clinton Global Initiative. We are designing for impact. So today, um, we are going to put aside some of the hierarchies. We've got lots of experts at tables. We've also got new people at tables. And we are all going to work together and go somewhere. Um, but let's start with the problem that we're going to be talking about today, is how do we provide safe and reliable energy for those who need it most? So we're going to start now with another video, and let's get immersed before we start. One point six billion people on the planet do not have access to safe and reliable energy. Seventy percent of these people are women and children. Two in five people on the planet cook their food using wood, coal, charcoal, or animal waste. A woman in the developing world could spend as much as eighteen hours a day gathering resources to cook her family's meals. If she cooks without a source of clean energy, Noxious chemicals are released, which give her children a much increased chance of dying from lung disease. And a mother's productive hours are lost, time she could have spent earning a living. Without electric light, her children can't study past sundown. Energy is essential to a healthy and productive life. How can we design solutions that make safe, reliable energy available to families across the globe? All right. So now you guys are going to take what you learned in the opening plenary session and turn them to actually doing in today's session. So here's what we're going to be doing with you um, in our time together the next 90 minutes. First off, we're going to have two wonderful speakers that you guys can glean inspiration from around energy issues. And then we're going to give you 25 minutes to generate new ideas to energy challenges in your table teams. And then we're going to give you another 15 minutes to hone in on one idea and dig deeper and develop it. And then we'll share as a group. And then we'll close it out by talking about how we can take some of these ideas to the next level. Before we get started with our speakers, um, who are both experts in their respective field, we want to seed you with three things to think about. And in product design, um, we talk about seeding before you go into a brainstorm so that you have greater ideas and you can generate more before going in. So for example, if you're doing a brainstorm about education, it's very common to go visit a school beforehand to kind of see what's happening, get ideas, get different perspectives. So today, when you're, when you're listening to our incredible speakers, think about these three things because it's going to come back in the brainstorm. We're going to talk about product and technology solutions, um, business models, innovative business models, and also financing that works to get to the people who need it most. First, I'd like to introduce Jim Rogers of Duke Energy Corporation. And Jim's going to come and join us on the stage. And our other speaker is Dr. Kende Yumkela, and he's the Director General of UNIDO. And we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Yumkela. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, President Obasanjo, President Figueres. Good to see you guys in the room. We had the number about 1.3 billion to 1.6 billion without access to electricity, 2.7 billion using biomass from cow dung to charcoal to cook. And you saw the impacts. We estimate roughly 2 million deaths every year, more than malaria and HIV AIDS, most of them women and children. Where are they located? The energy poor. 587 million in Africa, about 350 million in India, maybe 80 million in Bangladesh. But, uh, President Obasanjo, we think about 100 million in Nigeria. This is where they are. They are scattered. Ah, Mrs. Brutland, good to see you. 
You know where they're located. So I think one of the designers said, know your market. Okay, this is where they are. Challenge number one. The International Energy Agency estimates we need 48 billion a year over the next 20 years to eradicate energy poverty because we know the solutions. Question, how do we finance? The total money we have today from World Bank, EU, everybody giving aid is 9 billion. How do you scale up from 9 billion to 48 billion? You're a businessman. We see it as a market opportunity. Can you invest 48 billion? What would it take? So that's the scale, from 9 billion to 48 billion to eradicate energy poverty. Second challenge, the European Union, thank God, President Bas uh, B uh, Bar Barroso and Commissioner Pibax, who are on my high-level group, they have set a target for the EU to connect 500 million people to electricity within 10 years. The Germans added another 100 million. So we have a number here. But we are saying, can we reduce the energy poor by 50%? What will it take? What will it take to do that? The Secretary General, to make all of this happen, we know we need stable, predictable public policy. Private sector has told me that for the past five years. So what will we do to make that happen? Tomorrow, the Secretary General will announce that himself and the World Bank President will chair a new high-level group on sustainable energy for all. It's the first time in the UN. President of the World Bank and the Secretary General are going to chair something. Why? Energy poverty is real, but also, if we don't transform energy systems, we can solve climate change. 60 to 70 percent of the greenhouse gases come from energy-related activities. So they're putting their weight behind. That's politics. They will demonstrate to the General Assembly tomorrow they take this serious. Second, we have a huge group. We're going to form a new advisory group for him, 30 people. Of the 30, about 20 from private sector. We have some of them already. Chad, Chad Holiday, how many of you know Chad Holiday? Chairman Bank of America, he's with us. Jim is with us. They're giving us the solutions, the utility companies, the big oil companies, Start Oil and others, uh, Vestas, Suntech, all of them in the room, renewables and current fossil technologies. Some people say, why are you talking to the big oil companies and gas companies? There's a clear reason. In President Obasanjo's country, they burn the gas. 45 years of burning gas. We know today, 50 years, yes, sir. We know today that with the technologies available, if you use that gas to generate power for the poor in Africa, you can supply 50% of the electricity they need. But we've been burning it. Why did I recognize Mrs. Brutland? She knew price matters. She put a carbon tax in Norway 15 years ago. So you don't burn gas in Norway. You innovate. You do carbon capture and storage. Price matters. The price signals matter. But you know something? It's still profitable to produce oil in the North Sea. I've flown over those oil platforms myself. We want to do the same in Africa. Create gas markets. I just read in FT a month ago that in Mozambique, in Mozambique, we may have as much gas or more gas than Kuwait. We hope they don't burn it. They make women have access to energy so they can cook. They make our African economies grow. And yes, we can help the United States and the English and the French and the Germans have their energy security. But at the same time, our children have electricity to study and cook. For you, the businessmen, our idea now is to create a platform going forward. We got a boost in Rio, over $50 billion in pledges. The best outcome in Rio was what we did on energy, over $50 billion. European Investment Bank, $8 billion pledge. African Development Bank, $100 billion a year. Tomorrow you'll hear the Inter-American Development Bank, $5 billion, and so on and so forth. We know where the cash is, problem, design. How do we design these energy solutions? How do we deploy them? Some we know already. We need the big projects, but we also need the small, quick ones that we can deploy right now, tomorrow morning, and we can make energy poverty a history. That's why we need you. So at the political level, tomorrow the Secretary General and the Bank President will announce the mechanism going forward. They've asked me, yours truly, to step down from my current job and do this. My gosh, I'm so scared. But you know, the design people just gave me confidence this morning. Bill Clinton said, don't spend all your time designing. We have spent five years advocating for this, that energy is central to sustainable development, energy is central to global security going forward. We don't want to spend all the time designing. So they said, OK, you be the guinea pig. You lead the group now that will take the solutions to ground. So tomorrow, I'll decide in the morning, President Obasanjo, if I'll still do it. But what gives me confidence, <laughs> what gives me confidence is that they're businessmen, they're politicians who are ready to make this happen. 
this afternoon, we're very grateful. Uh, President Clinton has given us an opportunity. You'll have a de another design session, four to five. We want to see commitments so that we get together not only to deal with the energy poverty question, but energy efficiency and renewables. My last comment. We decided to take the political debate even further now. We defined the first set of sustainable development goals. Three clear goals we're going to hammer for the next 20 years. Goal number one, to make universal access to energy possible by 2030. Goal number two, to double the annual rate of improvement of energy efficiency by 2030. That immediately translates to 40% improvement in energy efficiency. Goal number three, double the share of renewables in the global energy mix, which we believe will be roughly about 30%, 24, 30%. If we do all three, we have shown by analysis, it keeps us a two degree world. If we do all of that by 2030, we know we'll lift another billion people out of poverty. But yes, we'll reduce that two million people who die every year because they use cow dung, they use charcoal, and they cut down the forest. Let's make energy poverty history. That's your challenge. Thank you very much. G Jim, I was told that you have the solutions. Can you hear me? Yes. My hope is that you are now inspired because it's very inspirational, the goals that have been set. My job is just a mere business guy to kind of talk through what models should be used to allow us to succeed going forward. And I'm going to focus first on solar lamps. I'm sure that you, there are many different ways to talk about this. That is a solar lamp there. You want to be Vanna White for me and hold that up? <laughs> he, he, he does that really well. You see, for the past decade, cell phones have dramatically changed the lives of the world's poor. In Uganda alone, 5% of the people in rural areas have electricity, even though 80% have a phone. In the next decade, many envision solar lamps to have a similar impact to cell phones. Solar lighting is dropping in price, it's improving in quality, and benefiting from business models that make it more accessible and more affordable. Cell phones became popular because they reduced the need for travel and changed business practices for the poor. The case for solar lamps offers similar game changers. First of all, using technology to charge a battery during the day and provide light at night will reduce or eliminate the need for kerosene. In turn, Homes will be safer as kerosene lamps are fire hazards. Kerosene fumes cause chronic pulmonary disease, and they produce CO2. And oftentimes, the light from a kerosene lamp is not strong enough to read by by night. As you saw, I brought an example because that is worth more than what I can say, just to look at it in the simplicity of it. Look at the solar panel. I was charging it in my room, sitting at the window to make sure it would stay on for a while. I can actually make it brighter, turn it off. Very a number of different size lights. And as we speak, um, earlier today, one of our team from the Global Bright Light Foundation was in Rwanda. We're doing experiments, trials, pilots, learning. As you heard this morning, we design for scale. The best way you design for scale is to do. And we're out doing with pilots. And I think that it's clear to us based on what we're learning from the pilots that we're doing, and I just got a text, I mean, an email back this afternoon, that we can demonstrate the technical capabilities, the financial logic, and adaptable operation approaches of the model. Now, solar lamps is one way. 
There are a number of other sustainable models that provide safe and reliable energy to those, and it's, and it's not easy. I mean, you got to take into account the basics. How do you do the distribution and the maintenance? How are you going to get the technology to the end user? How are you going to maintain it for the life of the technology? You also need to take into account cost. Like, what's the ideal price point? And if the cost makes financial sense compared to other options? Also, how are the end users going to buy or finance a solution? The price point might work, but it might not cover the total cost. How do you make up that difference? And I think most importantly, you have to engage women to make this work. That is one of the lessons that we're learning not as customers. They need to be distributors, producers, and maintenance agents. I want to share with you a great example. And there's an organization called Solar Sister, which is a 2012 CGI member and commitment maker. Catherine Lucy, who is the founder and CEO of Solar Sister, is here today. This organization realized that the distribution and use of traditional solar panels wasn't working. The technology wasn't intuitive. And the many women who were responsible for selling, distributing, and maintaining the solar panels were really comfortable, were not comfortable with the technology. So what did they do? They changed the model and they started focusing on solar lamps. The lamps are intuitive to use. I mean, even the two of us know how to use this. And, and I don't think either one of us fall in the category of being technologists. They're rugged, they're affordable, and they're available. Solar Sister also developed a financing model that enables women to secure inventory without paying a fee. Solar Sister is now distributing solar lamps in Uganda, Sudan, and Rwanda. They're empowering communities, and just importantly, they are empowering women. I know I focus almost solely on solar lamps, but it's just one of dozens or even hundreds of options. So let's go back to the beginning. I'll restate the original question. How can we provide safe and reliable energy to those in need. And we can break it into three areas. First, are the solutions, are the game changers, what are they? What are the products and technologies? Secondly, what is the right business model to make this happen? We need to develop models that are sustainable, innovative, and yet simple. The final area is financing meaning how can we make this work financially? Thank you all very much. This is going to be a fun afternoon. This is going to be a great challenge. And I challenge you to come up with models that will allow us to bring electricity in a sustainable way to the 1.3 to 1.6 billion people who do not have access to it today. Thank you all very much. Okay, with that introduction, we're going to switch the conversation to all of you. You guys are now uh, the experts in the room, and it's you guys who are going to work as teams to develop solutions to these challenges. So what we're going to do first is give you guys a chance to get to know everyone at your tables. So a quick show of hands. Who in your table um, is an expert or considers themselves an expert in product and technology development? Okay, we have a few folks. Take a look at your tables and see who those people are. Who considers themselves an expert in business models? Great, we have several of those. How about experts in financing or experience with financing? Wonderful. So as teams, 
you'll want to leverage these experts, but you'll also want to leverage the non-experts because these are the folks that can bring new eyes and fresh thinking to these challenges. So we're going to give you the next four minutes to introduce yourselves amongst your teams and get to know each other. Okay. We're without an electronic chime, so we're going back to the old style analog. Hopefully everyone's introduced themselves, have they? Great, thank you. And I heard yes, maybe it wasn't to me, but I'll take it. Um, okay, so we are going to get designing now, and we're going to start with brainstorming. And um, I know this is something we all talk about, we read articles about, we see how efficient it is in business practice. But a lot of us, um, particularly who are facilitating these sessions, are from the West Coast, and this is kind of our bread and butter. And I want to talk about why we do brainstorming, and particularly in such a diverse group with so many different levels of expertise. Um, but it's largely to get things going, to generate a lot of ideas. In a short amount of time, we don't have much time, we're trying to solve one of the biggest problems in the world in an afternoon. Um, we're trying to incorporate different perspectives. It's a little bit deliberate that everybody's mixed together. In the early days of planning this, we talked about grouping you by you know, different areas of expertise, and then the answer was no. We're throwing everyone in together because everyone's got unique perspectives. And then finally, we really want to build excitement around these different things. Um, you know, you may have alignment with people at other tables, but that will come out through the process. So before we start, we thought we would revert to the rules of brainstorming. There are seven of them, and I'm going to really quickly run through them. And this should help guide some of the conversation at your table. First of all, we really want to encourage wild ideas. This isn't just thinking outside the box. This is like crazy, wacky things that are out there. There's no bad ideas. And often really cool things come out of really random stuff. Second of all, deferred judgment. I think a lot of us, particularly those who do implementation, there's this kind of like niggling in the back of our head, like, oh, that won't work, or oh, that, you know, we've tried that. Just defer it, you know, put it aside, put everything aside, you can come back to that later. Third, build on the ideas of others. And this isn't just like, you may hear something at the table that spurs you on, you may know about an analogous situation, or maybe a completely different situation, but build on it. And you're going for quantity, kind of goes back to deferring judgment. We're not about quality today, we're just really about generating as much as we, we can. So really trying volume, volume, volume. One conversation at a time. There's lots going on here, there's tons of really interesting people, but really one conversation at a time. And I know many of you are at pretty crowded tables, and it may make sense to split up into some of the empty tables if you feel like that's going to be more productive for your group conversations. And then finally, I think this is number seven. If those of you counting, you can correct me. Um, stay focused on the topic. Again, there's so many interesting things, so many interesting backgrounds, but really you want to work on the topic at hand. And we're going to give you the topic. It's these three that Jim mentioned that we introduced with. So, oh, I do have one more. It's be visual. Um, in a very dark room, sitting around a table, it's hard to think outside of text and speakers, but we want you to draw, we want you to sketch. Some of you have construction paper. This is a first, I'm sure, at CGI. You have scissors. You have lots of things to build. Um, and if you're not comfortable, do it anyway. Um, this, is, this is a chance to really get out of your comfort zone. So please, even gestures, that's all part of being visual. Okay, just to help you guys out, will the, will the table facilitators raise their hands or stand up? Great. Everyone take a look at these people around the room. These guys are here to help you if you get stuck. They're here to help you guys move forward. And you'll also notice that you have these on your table. I'm going to hand this over to Krista. Oh. Everybody has one of these uh, wonderful worksheets on your table. We're going to present three different brainstorm challenges, and you'll notice that this is divided into three grids. You also notice that you all have post-its on your table. So first challenge, this line, second challenge, this line, third challenge, you can use this line. And every time you have a big idea, put it on a post-it and attach it to uh, whichever line you choose. So. Moving on to uh, the first question, we're going to give you seven minutes per question, and we'll be timing and sending you reminders. But the first question we want you guys to ask in your brainstorm is, how might we design novel product or technical solutions for those without access to energy? 
And remember the brainstorming rules, no judgment, just go for quantity and um, use the materials at your table to help get you out of that comfort zone. And your seven minutes starts now. One, one thing to add, seven minutes sounds like a long time, it's not. So think fast, <laughs> okay, quantity. We're trying something new. We were warned not to use a fork, but we figured we'd go with the informal way. Uh, now we want you to pick one idea. We're gonna flesh it out, um, spend a little time giving some legs to some of these more conceptual ideas that you've had. So in the next 15 minutes or so, you're gonna choose one idea. And um, if you're lucky enough to be at a table that has lots of ideas and you can't agree, again, maybe think about splitting tables and develop two ideas. Um, but I would spend no more than two or three minutes picking your idea, okay? Because you could spend your whole 15 minutes trying to figure out which one's the best one. Then what we're gonna do is refine the idea using the worksheet. So on everyone's table, you should have a worksheet. It won't be filled out like the one that Heather's showing, <laughs> but everybody pull it out. Okay, if you don't have one, raise your hand and one of our facilitators will come and give you a new one or if you, if you do decide that you wanna split up into two groups, we can also give you another one. I wanna walk you through what we're envisioning with this worksheet and I also wanna also put in the caveat that as designers, all of you don't have to follow exactly the rules. You should do what works for you with where your table's going, okay? And we're iterating this. You'll see if you come to other design sessions, we will be iterating these sessions a little bit. Um, but let's walk through what goes on this worksheet. At the top, we have concept title. And what that is, is gets to one of the three areas that we've been talking about. So a solution, the technology or product. Um, second one, we looked at business model. And third one is financing. So maybe put that category at the top. And I'll talk about this sheet in a minute. And then underneath where it says concept description, we want you to put like one sentence or a phrase that kind of gives meaning to your idea. So on the one we have here, it is affordable, clean microgrids owned by women entrepreneurs. And um, you might notice that this isn't perfectly filled out and that's great, it's okay. Um, so that would be the, the description that would go right in here. Um, down here you have this, what looks like a timeline. And this is where we wanna hear like, who is your customer? What does their day look like? How would they hear about the idea? And it doesn't have to be an end user, for example. It could be, you figured out a new way to do maintenance on solar panels in remote rural areas. And your user or your customer in this case might be the maintenance people and how you train them or something along those lines. Pick your perspective, pick your user, and then kind of walk through how they would engage with your idea. And then finally at the bottom, you have concept visualization. This is where we want you to sketch or draw or create some kind of 3D something with what you have on the table with your tape and your construction paper. You might also have some open questions and we, we get that you don't have very much time. We're asking you to solve a lot of problems. That's okay. This is, it's all about kind of pushing and getting new ideas and generating lots. So, you know, maybe put some of your open questions here that you see on the bottom. Okay, so you have, as of now, about 11 and a half minutes to do that. And if you need help, we're walking around. Oh, let me add one more thing. Where do these work worksheets go? They don't actually kind of go into the CGI ether. We're gonna put them into a binder so that everybody can see them after. We're gonna have a little bit of a report out as you know at the end, but these are gonna go in binders and they may go up publicly online. So one thing we'd also like you to do is to write everyone's name and contact information on the back. Okay, 11 minutes. <laughs>
If you haven't picked an idea already, pick one really fast. <laughs> you should be working on that.
Okay, time is up. <laughs> All right, we're going to ask a few of you to share some of your ideas. And um, we have a few minutes to do this. Um, first off, who has an idea around a product or a technology? Anybody? Any groups? Would you guys mind sharing? We have some mics. The facilitators have mics. Yeah. And maybe quickly just say your name, too, please. Kristen Dorglow. Uh, we are proposing the Energy Enterprise, which is with a Z-E. <laughs> uh, which is an international competition for uh, a combination of technology companies plus deployment partners who successfully uh, distribute and implement a village level energy generation and storage microgrid solution for a minimum X year duration with local adoption proven and data gathered. So this is an incentive prize competition for microgrid village level solutions. Great, and perfect amount of length of time in explaining, too. Thank you. And great visualizations. They get points for having cut out a sun and a dollar sign. <laughs> you have one, too. Okay, great. Spec table. Wait until the mic gets oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great. So ours is also a, a microgrid concept, but what, we, what we've called it is, is microenergy hubs. And the idea is to combine microgrid and other micro energy infrastructure with microfinance to make village or neighborhood based solutions to energy poverty uh, really vibrant and, and exciting and successful. And the basic idea is that, that a series of products and services that would be designed to really solve the, the consumer needs in these neighborhoods and villages would be put together by a local entrepreneur uh, who would basically sell products and services like centralized cell phone charging, centralized cooking and refrigeration services along with refrigerated, you know, hyper-refrigerated, refrigerated, insulated, uh, excuse me, uh, containers that could carry cooked food or, or cold food home and keep it that way um, uh, with, uh, with microgrid services for based on solar and battery storage for the, the platform and all of this would be financed through a combination of microfinance and Kickstarter finance through the very cell phone network, the transaction, the marketing, the completion, um, and the financing would all take place through cell phones. Um, and the f initial seed money might be from a, you know, like a World Bank or a NGO or a corporation, but it would grow through both microfinancing and as it became successful, macrofinancing by mainstream banks. Great, thank you. How about, oh, wonderful. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good sketch, actually. How many are, do any tables have any new solutions around business models or distribution models? Great, you guys mind sharing? It's a local energy market. Okay, I can do it. <laughs> it's a local energy market. Uh, the idea is a physical market. Is, is a place, a market. It could be a predetermined one, or it can move over the weeks, or over the month, like in the markets in southern France. At the market, you bring the products, solar lamp, coal stove, solar water heaters, batteries, etc. whatever the product is, and end users can acquire that through cash, goods, or, or the offer of work to be performed. An NGO or microfinance manage the, the actual exchange and the ulterior commercialization of the good. Uh, we believe they can re really accelerate because shorten the access to the product. People bring their job or things they have and they get the product in, in exchange. That's it. Great. What about financing? Anyone have a solution around financing? Yep. All right, we'll do both of these tables. Uh, start with this table. Sorry. Hi there. Um, 
So we were looking at the, the problem of, of financing it, to get clean tech products into the countries that we're working in <coughs> um, and trying to have greatest impact. And quite often what we find is that the SMEs, the local companies or NGOs or uh, organizations simply don't have enough working capital. Um, so when we were looking at thinking around providing, whether it's uh, cook stoves or water filters or solar powered LED lights, what is what can we do when the people who are providing finance often don't or can't get as close as they need to to the SME in, let's say, Africa? So um, what we're doing is setting up, what we think of doing is setting up a fund whereby the company who's providing the products can themselves act as the, the, um, uh, the, the person or the company holding the, the cap working capital. So a uh, solar distributor innovation fund as such. And uh, I, I mean, I joined our group a little bit late and they were talking about it and they said, what we really need is some sort of solar panel any design. And I said, you mean, you mean like this? So um, just so happened we happen to have the, uh, the, the solar panel and LED light as an example. So that's our, uh, we, we didn't actually use the materials on the, pa on the table. <laughs> Thank you. Can we bring a mic to this table here? Okay. Thanks. We had a fantastic opportunity because we had Catherine Lucy here from Solar Sisters, and what we really focused on was how do we scale her model. We were talking about it earlier when Jim was speaking about it, and, and it's a model that I think um, the strategies that we have in place, others can learn from too, not just specific to her organization. It's a nonprofit, and she supports for-profit women entrepreneurs and is right now in Uganda. And so what we were focused on is how do we scale that 100x? She has 180 entrepreneurs now. How do we scale that 100 times? We have a little artwork. I'm not very good <laughs> at um, In Africa to three other target countries. And her key challenges were around finding the right people, so finding the entrepreneurs, training the entrepreneurs, also at home headquarters, back office support, data management. And so we talked about how do we best find um, business model partners such as companies like Avon, Procter & Gamble, and others who may see market opportunities here. These are women who would potentially be buying their products if they had greater access to electricity, but they also have good distribution strategies they might be able to bring to the table as well as that business support. Anything else I missed? Okay. All right, we have a few minutes left, so switching gears a little bit. Did any groups come up with solutions that could be implemented tomorrow? I think reasonably it could be implemented tomorrow. We came up with an idea to uh, create a uh, solar kiosk. This one apparently is uh, sponsored by Coca-Cola. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> another one there. Oh, there we go. See? Very easy. We could implement these tomorrow. Uh, the solar kiosk would be centrally located, either in a market or perhaps by a school in a village. And it would have the ability to charge uh, anything that has a battery. So whether it be a cell phone or maybe a laptop or a, a, a mobile television, anything that has a battery could be hooked up. Uh, the payment model would be via cell phone. And uh, the financing model for bringing the solar kiosk into a, a locale would be through microcredit and also possibly the assistance of larger corporations. Anybody else? OK. Thank you. So my name is Paul Nahi. So we came up with, I, I think, a concept that several other people have talked about as well, which is the development of a microgrid with a waste energy uh, conversion instead of using a diesel generator. And you can develop an infrastructure behind that, uh, as well as augmenting it then with uh, distributed solar. And the good news there is that the technology is here. Uh, we have a financing structure, I think, that would reward those people who could benefit from it. Um, and it's really more of an implementation issue. So the combination, I think, doesn't require any R&D or uh, any large uh, business infrastructure. Oh, okay. We're going to get you a mic. Hang on a sec, because we want to get you on video, too. Thanks. Uh, we also wanted to address the issue of cooking which seems to be a huge problem. And uh, today uh, in uh, the plenary session, there was a mention that uh, women take 18 hours a day to collect uh, wood for cooking and water and things like that. But uh, the price of coal is dropping tremendously in the United States. And apparently, there's a company uh, called Enviro 
and viral cooking that has developed a, a, a cold stove. Uh, it's, it's a pellet, actually, that uses rice waste and coal primarily. And it costs uh, about one-fourth of what LPG costs. Uh, so um, it is a way to avoid uh, the, uh, the cutting of trees and, and you know, the, the just gathering of wood. And at the same time, apparently it has very low emissions and it comes with a stove and, a, and there's a plan for it. Um, so I think that that might be an, a useful thing in, in countries where uh, there's no availability of, uh, of gas or other ways of cooking. Okay, two more groups that were willing to share, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, our model is quite similar to the one of the table over there, but ours is slightly more community-based in the sense that um, we propose that we can build um, community energy centers um, that would generate power from solar or wind or any other renewable source. And um, the, the, it will be self-sustaining because um, th those energies will be driven uh, or be used or channeled to, to drive um, enterprise. And there will be contributions from the, the locality and to support irrigation for agriculture, um, support any micro enterprise as it, as it, it will be. Um, that's basically it. Did I miss anything? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our idea is a new type of public-private partnership that would deliver for the poorest. And we started off thinking about the 1.3 to 1.6 billion and then scaled ourselves down to a municipality and looked at it at that <laughs> scale. So we're talking about 3 million people in a municipality um, without access to electricity, perhaps living in slum areas. And what we're proposing is an idea whereby we use the municipality as a facilitator between the, the target consumer base, if you like, of those living without electricity, and big business in the area. Big business are going to be interested in this group of people because they're their future consumers. And the idea is to find ways of leveraging those big businesses who have the technology solutions and also access to finance to work via with the municipality and the municipality's relationships with those communities to provide the energy solutions that they need so that one day those poor people living out without electricity can be buyers of um, refrigerators and TVs and everything that big business wants to sell to them. Thank you. In the interest of time, we're going to have to move on. I'm sorry, I know there's some groups that we're waiting to share. Um, but before I pass it over to Chris, just a quick show of hands. How many of you generated solutions that members would be willing to try? That's wonderful. Great, so I'm glad that we'll be collecting those. So just to um, reiterate that these worksheets that you've worked on will go out to the design desk and they will be there and um, hopefully we will figure out some way to multiply them so it's just not one person looking through the book. Um, but I want to take us back to about an hour and a half ago where we started with our problem of 1.6 billion people who don't have access to electricity that they need and where we've come in that time. And Jim really challenged us to think broadly to think about systems, um, to think about where technology is going. And Kende, you've really also, I think, spoken to where we are going in a very exciting way, particularly with what you're going to be doing. Um, but what's the potential? Where do we really need to get by 2030 in terms of not just funding, but technology, distribution, and, and ways to actually do and get things done? And one of the things I'm hearing come out of the report backs is this focus on implementation. Um, with all the experts here at the table, I love that the table over here went from 1.x billion to a principal, to, we'll say a fiefdom for now, <laughs> um, to a smaller group because at the end of the day, this is about moving forward. It is about prototyping, but ultimately with the goal of impact, and that's why we're here is designing for impact. Um, from a design standpoint, I want to tell you a few things that were very exciting for Heather and I, and that is seeing all these people with very diverse backgrounds from all walks of life, some of you who have run countries and who have run corporations and do that now, um, coming together and coming up with very fruitful, thoughtful, and creative ideas. Um, and I want to just show one of the areas, too, that I particularly love is when you take found objects <laughs> and turn them into prototypes. Um, and as you can see, it's not just the 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 notes on the table, it's actually cans. So 
thank you for um, stepping out of your comfort zone. I know many of you, this is a new exercise. This is a new type of experience. Um, with that, let's, why don't we go to what the next steps are. So if you heard something that's interesting today or something that was at your table, please check in with the design desk outside. Um, we have two of our um, facilitators, maybe raise your hands, thank you, um, who will be manning this table. And this is a way to make sure that if there is something that you're particularly engaged with, that we move it forward. Um, and if you haven't already, please do exchange contact information of people at the table. Exchange your business cards. We do want you to stay in touch. We do want these ideas to turn into action and ultimately turn into impact. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the meeting.